straight into the Word of God. If you have your Bibles, grab them out. And we are going to Genesis 2, 19 and 20. It's the very beginning of the story you're all so familiar with. God said, let there be light and the world was created in seven days. And in Genesis 2, God is gardening gardeners. He's creating this beautiful garden for Adam and Eve to live in. And it looks like we're all ready. Here we go. In Genesis 2, God says, He brought them... Oh, so the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he could call them. And the man chose a name for each one. He gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, and all the wild animals. I've always loved these passages. I've loved these lines because right after creation, God Almighty creating the world, he shows that he's a relational God. Yeah. I can imagine him and Adam uh, sitting in the cool of the day and God calling forth animal by animal saying, what do you want to call this one, Adam? Mm, buffalo. What do you want to call this one, Adam? Cow. Cow. <laughs> What do you want to call this one? Butterfly. This must have taken ages. But God obviously liked spending time with Adam. It must have been loads of fun. I know in our family we love to name things. Naming pets, naming, uh, naming cars, new parents. The joy of going through those books and finding a, a, a baby name that is significant and joyful and, 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 and relevant. It's full of joy. God must have loved that time. And we're quickly going to play a game because I can't get the kidsmen out of me. So up on the screen, you will see a strange uh, animal. Uh, Tony, <laughs> this is a real animal. It looks like it's floating in the sea. It's got a lot of legs with claws in it. What are we going to name it? Frank. No. no. <laughs> what are we going to name it? <laughs> Oh, I like that one. I like that one. This one is the elephant octopus. Next one. That's a, a real animal. Elephant octopus. What about this one? The snout. The snout. <laughs> totally, it's like a, it's a, it's a deer with this long vacuum cleaner the nose. And that's actually a Sega mongoose. Should we do one more? Yeah. Oh, shame. But Tony, this one looks like a big load of snot. Uh, with a nose and two eyes. Any names for this one? <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. So, Tony, this one's a trick. It's Half a shark, half a, half a horse. Okay, okay. So we're going to fast forward from Genesis to 445 BC Nehemiah. And this is our topic today, which is working and partnering. And working obviously means we're laboring, and partnering is not the silent partner type partnering, where someone sits back and does nothing and reaps the dividends. This is where people work together and are uh, collaborating and co-laboring towards a mutual agreement. So we're fast-forwarding to Nehemiah, Dave and Peter and um, uh, Mark have been preaching on this for some while, so we're okay with the context. We know what that the Jewish nation was in, in exile and they had this opportunity to come back and rebuild the walls of uh, Jerusalem. So we're in that third wave, 445 BC, and we're in the book of Nehemiah. And I know last week Dave preached on opposition. Yeah. Yes. And it's kind of like the same passage that we're looking at again, which is Nehemiah 4. We're going to look at 6 and 10 to 23. So if you've got your Bibles, my lovely husband is going to... Do the reading for you. This text is really small. <laughs> <laughs> At last the war was completed, half its height around the entire city.
for the people had worked with enthusiasm. Then the people of Judah began to complain. The workers are getting tired and there's much rubble to be moved. We'll never be able to build walls by ourselves. Meanwhile, our enemies were saying, before they know what is happening, we will swoop down upon them and kill them and end their work. The Jews who lived near the enemy came and told us again and again, they will come from all directions and attack us. So I placed armed guards behind the lowest parts of the wall in the exposed areas. I stationed the people to stand guard by families, armed with swords, spears and bows. Then, as I looked over the situation, I called together the nobles and the rest of the people and said to them, Don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord, who is great and glorious. And fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. When our enemies heard that we knew of their plans and that God had frustrated them, we all returned to our work on the wall. But from then on, only half my men worked while the other half stood guard with spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. The leaders stationed themselves behind the people of Judah, who were building the wall. The laborers carried on their work with one hand supporting their load, and one hand holding a weapon. All the builders had a sword belted to their side. The trumpeter stayed with me to sound the alarm. Then I explained to the nobles and officials and all the people, the work is very spread out, and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. When you hear the blast of the trumpet, rush to whoever it is sounding it. Then our God will fight with us. One more? We worked early and late, from sunrise to sunset, and half the men were always on guard. I also told everyone living outside the wall to stay in Jerusalem. That way, they and their servants could help with guard duty at night and work during the day. During this time, none of us, not I, nor my relatives, nor my servants, nor the guards who were with me, ever took off our clothes. We carried our weapons with us at all times, even when we went for water. So these people were working really hard. They didn't even take their clothes off. Huh? Hard workers. Okay, so we're going to comb through Nehemiah 4, and we're going to look at Nehemiah's five Ps, five tips for kingdom building, five tips for working and partnering together. And when I'm talking about kingdom building, I'm talking about working for God's purposes. So, our first P is pulled together. They had a united vision, and they had come together to build these walls. Um, we know previously there was actually some opposition. The nobles of Tekoya said, we're not going to uh, work alongside the workers. And we know that there was some grumbling and complaining. But at this point, something of Nehemiah's vision had caught their hearts. And they had yeah. pulled together and they were united. Really important for kingdom building. Second P is they were prepared. And by prepared, I mean they prayed. Nehemiah, Charles Swindon said, is the greatest biblical leader from the knees up. Because this guy knew how to pray. His first instinct was also always to pray. At every turn he prayed. In the passage we've just read, verse 4, he prayed. Verse 9, he prayed. If we're kingdom building and we want to be prepared, we are praying. Dave, I think in your preach last week you said that prayer was offense and and defense, and it's pre preparation for the offense, and it's preparation for the defense. We were actually sharing this at the dinner table last night, and the boy said, oh, that sounds like a sports match. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, I mean, it's not, it's kind of, but it's not, a, it's not that kind of game, and we are, and we're going for victory. So prayer, really important, and isn't it lovely that we've got a, ch a church and a community with a heart for prayer? Then Nehemiah had a plan. This wasn't some haphazard uh, uh, task that just suddenly miraculously happened. Nehemiah was actually quite or well organized. He uh, assigned, it looks like, 44 uh, different groups to work. People were assigned with logic, so the priests were by their sheep gate because that would have been meaningful for them. Uh, families were near their homes, so there was uh, logic an order to the building. He used people according to their strengths. 
And I don't know if you notice how many different people are mentioned in this passage, because we have the nobles and the leaders and the relatives and the brothers and the sisters and his friends. Everybody is mentioned. Everybody is doing something, but everybody is not doing everything. So we have to, we have to play to our uh, strengths when we are kingdom building. Um, there's a lovely picture. And it's a strange picture of contending and building. Um, there's a threat of attack, and Nehemiah says, first of all, I'm going to change my plan. That's also important when you're planning. Sometimes you have to be led by the Spirit, and you have to be a bit flexible. But he's going to change his plan because of the threat. Half of the workers were going to be standing guard, and the other half were going to carry on building. And then the people who are building... Sorry for you, but you're going to have to carry your trowel and a sword at the same time. That must have been so awkward. Uh, a commentator said it was like trying to paint your house with the AK-47 sl slung over your back. Very, incon in very inconvenient and awkward, but what a brilliant picture of our Christian walk. We are building, we are painting, but we've got our sword with us at the same time. And there's a little picture of a uh, contending and uh, building. At the same time, with plans, sometimes the leader's plans are going to change. <laughs> and here, I've used the term pliant. And I'm not meaning that from the people were easily manipulated and wishy-washy and just went with the uh, flow of, a, of opinion. They were pliant in that they weren't stiff-necked. They weren't rigid. They trusted their leader. When there was a change and the leader said, we're going to work from sunrise to sunset, they trusted him and they followed him. That's really important. We can't have churches full of chiefs and no workers. The number four P for kingdom building is perspective. Nehemiah did this so well. Very easily, the Jewish people could have been focusing on the rubble that was the walls of Jerusalem and the absolute mess that their city was in. But instead, Nehemiah kept on pointing them to the Lord. In verse uh, 14, don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord who is great and glorious. In verse 20, our God will fight for us. In ver uh, chapter 2, verse 20, the God of heaven will help us succeed. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. He kept pointing them to the Lord. In whom do we trust? God. Who's fighting for us? God. Who will help us? God. I don't think they had a chance to uh, look at the rubble because their eyes were fixed on the Lord. Perspective is so important in life. There's a uh, a silly little proverbial tale about a traveller arriving at a, a, a quarry and there were three workers and the one looked totally miserable, the other one looked really intent and purposeful and uh, the third one looked totally elated. So he asked, he asked each of them, what are you doing? And the first one said, I'm cutting stone. That's the miserable one. <laughs> the second one, who looked purposeful, said, I'm earning a wage to feed my family and put a roof over their heads. Purposeful. The third one that looked elated, he said, I'm building a temple. Hey, how's that for perspective? So perspective is important with kingdom building. And then lastly, they played the trumpet. So they didn't have a beautiful jazz quartet, obviously, uh, playing mood music in the background while they were building. It also, the trumpet wasn't a beautiful brass instrument like we've seen a Dave playing today. It was a shofar, and it was a huge ram's horn that was curly. And this ram's horn would have been taken from the sheep that was slaughtered for sacrifice. So uh, this is actually quite important that they played the trumpet because. Uh, Nehemiah had assigned them into 44 different groups, and they had no way of communicating. So that trumpet, that sounding of the trumpet, was a rallying point. It was a way of bringing scattered people together. 
really important when you ke- when you're kingdom building. We might be scattered, but we need rallying points when we get to when we get together. Also, thanks to Dave for the pointer about the shofar actually being a prophetic picture of Jesus' blood uniting all of us, bringing us together. Um, uh, in South Africa, I had a teacher friend who had a shofar. And she went for training to play it because it's quite difficult to get a noise out of it. And things weren't going really well at school, so we decided we were going to march around the school uh, property. She would be blowing the shofar, and I, was, I would be praying, and all those the negative walls of Jericho would come cr- crumbling down. Um, I, yeah, I don't know the, the, the spiritual outcome of that, but we did it in school holidays. So no one would, would see the two crazy, crazy ladies. But it's really important when we're kingdom building, we are going to play that trumpet. We are going to rally around Jesus. So, what was the outcome of these five Ps? Not just any wall. So after 52 days, only 52 days, only 52 days, they built the walls of the city, complete. It was miraculous. I think they probably themselves were totally stunned. The neighboring nations were stunned. (laughs) They knew there was a great and glorious uh, God of that nation. So... The, 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 the building of the walls glorified yeah. God. Yeah. Built a nation, but it also built a, commun- a community that was centered on worshiping God and uh, focusing on God, uh, which I think is so important. Okay, so let's fast forward again. Let's fast forward from Old Testament to New Testament when hallelujah, for God so loved the world that he sent his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sends his master plan to rescue us from our sins. And Jesus, when he arrives and starts his ministry, he starts kingdom building. And he doesn't do it alone. He gets the motley crew. (laughs) He gets the motley crew, the fishermen and a couple of tax collectors. And he shows them how to build together. And actually when Jesus uh, is resurrected and ascends in Matthew 28, he leaves what's called the Great Commission. Where he says, go to all the nations and baptize everyone in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then he says, and I will be with you. So we're going to be building with him. He is with us. There are also two lovely New Testament uh, uh, passages. These were to the early church, who again would have been working and partnering with the the Lord. Uh, First being Philippians 1, 3 to 5. I thank God in all my remembrance of you because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. If we then jump to 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9 and 10, for we are co-workers. It doesn't say that God is sovereign and we need to shoot up a couple of prayers and then he'll do it all himself, even though he could and he doesn't need our help. The word says we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. We are laborers together. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So, I'm going to come into land, which is preacher terms for coming to the end. So if we fast forward, we've done Genesis, Nehemiah, early church. Let's fast forward to the 2nd of June, 2024. Let's fast forward today and let's think about what Nehemiah's lessons 
have to teach us about working and partnering together. Um, I think of those P's that we looked at, probably that first P. If we don't get that first P right, we are going nowhere. Can you remember what the first P was? It was together. Thank you. Thank you, note takers. <laughs> She's taking notes. Um, pull, pull together. That unity is so important. What does it look like? Are we looking after each other? Are we caring for each other? Are we helping each other? Are we not gossiping about each other? Are we standing up for each other? Are we really united as a family? And as a family, when the, the division comes, because it comes, and we know that there's going to be opposition, do we sort it out quickly and do we sort it out biblically? That's really important for unity. That's internally. Then externally, are we captured by the vision that God has given us? Revelation 9 talks of a multitude a multitude of every creed, tongue, color, culture standing in the throne room of heaven. Are we going to help populate heaven? Are we going to help adding numbers to the multitudes? Because we're going to be there. Yeah. And we are called. So are we united in this vision? Because if you have a look at the Grace Community website, there's a similar vision. <laughs> it's the same. Yeah. Every age, every culture, and we want to reach the community and we want to reach the nations. Grace Community wants to chart the church, church plant. Yeah? Yeah. 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 Yes. So we've got to be pulled together. The second point, prayerful. Oh, we're going to have lots of opportunities to pray. Wasn't it wonderful? Uh, uh, well done, Sergio and Sarah, the, pray, the praying the, 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 this morning. Um, oh, pray without ceasing. Just pray, 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 and, and, and pray. So excited to be part of those corporate days and then the Edenbridge prayer. And thirdly, I think we, uh, the, 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 the very important is that perspective, having that kingdom perspective. Oh, I'm reading a book at the moment called Pray Like uh, Monks and Live Like Fools. And the, <laughs> the, the author, somebody, Stanton, when he was 13 years old and he was a bit of a Christian skeptic, he, someone encouraged him to pray for everybody in his year group, so all the year eights. And for some reason, he decided, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for everybody. He got his mum to drop him off at school uh, at half six every morning during school holidays. And he walked round and round the school. And in those days, he had a, he had a directory. And he prayed for every single uh, of his year eight peers by name. So he prayed. But then, when school holidays was finished, came back to school and asked the uh, headmaster, can he lead a Jesus club? And can he lead it at half past six in the morning in the maths classroom? <laughs> this was his little plan. And he was just going to read a scripture the night before and then talk about it. And um, what happened with his prayer and his plan is that the maths classroom wasn't big enough. Your aides were arriving at school at half past six in the morning. Isn't that ridiculous? And by the end of the year, a third of his year group were following Jesus. <laughs> hey? Yeah. Wow. And that was sounded like a ridiculous plan. <laughs> uh -huh. But you know, with us, we just do our best. <laughs> and God, he does the rest. Yeah. He does the rest. So, um, yeah. if you're like me and you hear a talk on kingdom building and serving more and all of that, you might be feeling a little bit overwhelmed. And you wow. think, I've got no more time, I've got a busy family life, I'm working full time. I come against that spirit of yes, feeling yes, overwhelmed yes. in Jesus' mighty name. Yes, yes, Because yes. back in Genesis, God wants to spend time with us and he wants to have fun with us. And some of us might be feeling like, I've got nothing to bring. My life is a mess. I'm struggling to just to show up. <laughs> Remember Nehemiah? God is fighting for you. <laughs> Let's get your perspective right. <laughs> I 
pray to that, 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 that spirit of, I'm not capable. Bind it in Jesus' name. Yeah. And then, yeah, some of us might think, I don't have any gifts and talents to bring. And we saw in Nehemiah that everybody did something. Yeah. I, I, this I stole from Peter's PowerPoint. <laughs> Thanks, Peter, for the, 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 the lack of pledge. Well, that we're allowed to plagiarize each other's PowerPoints. <laughs> and Peter gave a, a, a great uh, uh, um, uh, analysis of all the different ways that we serve in church. And I know I'm preaching here to the converted. Everybody is lifting and doing kids. And do you know we have someone who does the birthday cards? <laughs> very, a, very, a, a very special lady. There are so many ways that you can collaborate and uh, co-labor with God in church. But I want the Holy Spirit to stir us for some new and creative ways to reach Eden Bridge. Because it is significant that we live in a place called Eden. It is significant, but some people are living in hell in Eden. That is significant. It's significant that it's called Eden Bridge. Because we know that the bridge from hell to heaven is Jesus. We know Jesus. So it's significant that we live here. It's significant that we're all here today. So I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to start stirring up in us new, fresh, creative, fun ideas for ways to partner with him and work with him. And you will see on your chair there is a post-it. <laughs> on the back of your chair there is a post-it. And when I've finished praying and we've had some time to just rest in what the Lord is saying, my lovely assistant is going to pass around some pens. And if you can just very anonymously... Oh, thanks, they're out there on the bench on the side. Write down... Yeah some ideas, or just an idea, or just a person's name, for ways that we are going to partner and work with God. Tony, I'll, I'll, they'll get someone to come and help you. of them and then my plan is I want to personally invite them there's such power in a personal invite yeah. now I've said it now I have to do it <laughs> I have to do it I have to do it this week okay shall we pray